Hello everyone and thank you for stopping in. I hope today finds everybody safe and healthy and happy. I have to admit I've been busy lately and I have got quite a bit behind, but thank you for stopping in. Today's video is titled simply, Indian Navy Races to Counter China. Now I know there are some tensions with India and China and India's northern region there up in the Himalayas. They've had a few border crosses there in the past few years. But it seems like China is kind of making everybody in the South China Sea region and including the Philippines, Taiwan of course, um, Japan, Vietnam, and pretty much everybody in the region a little nervous and a little irritated with their aggressive policies. Um, but I don't really hear that much about the Indian Navy. I do know they've been trying to modernize their military a lot in the last few years. And, uh, anyways, that's enough of my no more than great. That's enough of my non-expert opinion. We'll put it that way. My non-expert opinion. Here we go. Let's find out how... Indian Navy is racing to counter China. India has started building up its Navy and establishing bases further out to sea in a move to secure their maritime backyard. The Indian Ocean connects prime shipping routes and over 2.7 billion people live in the various countries surrounding it. Yet despite the name, the Indian Ocean is one of China's main geostrategic priorities and they appear to be making moves to box in and try to bypass India for decades as part of their maritime Silk Road strategy. China's Navy has recently made high-profile maneuvers through the Indian Ocean with submarine visits right off their shores in Sri Lanka and then to Pakistan. The Chinese government, of course, claimed that they're... Does anybody know what's India is? I know they've... I've thought they've always had a great relationship with Sri Lanka. He said Sri Lanka. I thought it was Sri Lanka. But I thought they've always had a real strong relationship, but is it, how's it stand now? Just let me know in the comments, please. Their increased activity was all about trade and security, harmless, not aimed at their rivals in India. However, they did say, quote, the Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. In response, India is aiming to change the state of play by building a true. That is funny that they say the Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. But they want to say the South China Sea is China's sea. Through Blue Water Navy that can stand up to any opponent and project Indian power across the Indo-Pacific region. How can India modernize their naval power? What kind of ships is India building? And what do they tell us of the country's overall strategy? This Military Appreciation Month, Navy Federal Credit Union is celebrating active duty service members, veterans, and their families. For more than 90 years, Navy Federal has made it their mission to support the military community. The military community goes above and beyond every federal.org slash celebrate to see all our Military Appreciation Month offers and other Navy Federal offers. At Navy Federal, the members are the mission. Navy Federal is federally insured by NCUA. We get our earliest hints of the Indian naval strategy from this 30-page declassified document from the CIA. Their analysis states that following India's independence, they originally pursued a naval strategy that was mainly just diplomatic measures because they had yet to build up a large force. Here's how an Indian expert from the Brookings Institute named Dhruva J. Shankar explains it. India is geographically located at the ocean's center and has 7,500 kilometers of coastline. The ocean has long been a key determining factor of India's cultural footprint with people, religion, goods, and customs spreading from India to Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, and vice versa. Following India's independence from British rule in 1947, the country operated mostly foreign vessels in its navy for much of the 20th century. India has inherited two frigates and a few dozen smaller vessels from the UK but also purchased or licensed from other nations over the following decades, despite close- Like in historical times, I don't remember ever learning about India ever being historically a great naval power. I'm just trying to think, I know, you know, China was, you had a, uh, India for as large as it is, I, I just can't remember them ever having a good navy. I mean, it's not a knock on them. 
it's just I think they've always been, you know, they were there at the crossroads of trading. And, you know, it was maybe just little short hops, but they've never really had, you know, that big of a navy that I've ever can remember in world history or an influential navy. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know. Close ties to the British Navy, following almost a century of colonial rule, India didn't want to get drawn into the superpower clash of the Cold War. This is because India believes in a policy known as strategic autonomy. You know how there are some people who are all about brand loyalty and only buy Apple products and nothing else? India's military has historically been the exact opposite of that. What that means is they want to reserve the right to make their own decisions independent of external pressure. So they I think you're actually even seeing that right now where they're buying the cheap Russian oil kind of against the United States will. And, you know, China's hugging on Russia a little bit, loving on Russia. And uh, India's kind of a little pissed at China. So they, you know, they got, they got some issues there. They make sure to equip themselves with ships and gear from both sides of the Iron Curtain. See, but then you look, run, if you're getting gear from everybody, you run into logistics issues as far as, yeah, you can't get cut off by any one person, but you have to keep so many spare parts on hand. It doubles, triples the number of spare parts. It just is not a good strategy in the long run. By 1990, 70% of their vessels and equipment were from the Soviet Union, with the other 30% a mix of other nations. But this is when India started to cook up their long-term game plan. The story of how India went from a buyer to a builder was not a simple A to B process. They started developing their own indigenous shipbuilding industry as early as the 1960s. The government of India nationalized several large shipyards during this decade, including the now famous Mazagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited, turning them over to a naval repair and refit yard. Indian shipyards worked with more experienced foreign companies to jointly design and build weapon systems, engines, and sensors. This allowed them to gain valuable know-how and industrial capacity along the way. Here's a quote from the declassified CIA document on India's naval strategy. India's strategy is centered on maritime defense and the assertion of its leadership over other regional states. It also includes supporting the internal stability of these states. The assertion of its leadership on other regional states. I wonder who is calling its other regional states. You'd say Pakistan's right next door, but they're not doing too good. They've got the whole thing going on in Kashmir. You know, both have nuclear weapons. You got Bangladesh. Okay, I will say they probably do exert a bit of influence on Bangladesh. I've already asked about Sri Lanka. Who else are they wanting to, you know, push their leadership on? I'm curious about that. Nepal, of course, but Nepal's never gonna hurt anybody. You know, we, we don't know, nobody's ever gonna hurt Nepal. Nepal's never gonna hurt. Protecting the interests of local Indian ethnic groups and limiting, if not supplanting, foreign presence. I wouldn't blame you for being skeptical of anything the CIA said, but normally their military analysis documents are pretty on point. Their coup department is on a different floor. The document goes on to state that beginning in 1988, India started to modernize and expand their navy to actually start projecting power. This is not the actual CIA document printed out. I'm just holding this because it makes me look smarter than I actually am. So by the 1980s, India had enough technical knowledge to design and build their first fully indigenous ship hull, the Godaviri class frigate. The Godaviri frigates were capable for the time and received numerous upgrades over their lifespan. 2004 was a historic year for India's Navy because it's when they published their first maritime doctrine. The paper was titled Freedom of Use of Seas, Indian Maritime Military Strategy. Perhaps it's best described in the words of someone who's actually from that region, according to Ala Nawaz from SouthAsianVoices.org, quote, this doctrine emphasized the role of the Indian Navy in allowing India to, quote, use Indian Ocean waters for its national interest. 
In that time period, India still understood itself as an emerging power with a limited naval force confined to coastal waters. However, Indian strategists were acutely aware of the changing dynamics in the Indian Ocean, specifically China's growing military capabilities. Then, in 2009, India dropped a hot, fresh new doctrine paper. There are several key changes. They replaced the word doctrine with strategy and stated that they were committed to securing the waters of the Indian Ocean instead of simply using them. These are important distinctions, showing that India was taking a larger role in security and attempting to do it in a way that respected their regional name. Okay, that sounds like uh, establishing some bases outside. You know, some bases may be... Oh, the Maldives, I guess. Maybe you've got some small islands heading out there towards Southeast Asia. I'm just not sure how much land there is out there. But you've got some small islands, you know, with the possibility of it. Or you can do like China and just build your own islands. Another major reason for India's modernization was to ensure a second strike capability so that their nuclear weapons were not just on land, vulnerable to being taken out by bombs. They didn't yet have a ballistic missile submarine capable of launching a second strike nuclear weapon at the time, but it was on the top of their priorities for their shifting strategy and doctrine. An interesting thing to keep in mind is that the Indian Ocean became more valuable recently in history. Between 1950 and 2010, fishing increased 13-fold to now account for 15% of the world's fishing. Since 1970, there's been four times the amount of commercial shipping volume to now 90,000 vessels that annually transit here. 40% of the world's offshore oil production takes place here. Owen. Okay, I did not know that much oil production took place in the Indian Ocean. That is pretty impressive. I am impressed with that. See, I'm glad I love learning these things. When something becomes more valuable, there's going to be competition for it. India-Chinese relations started to sour to some degree in 2013 when a platoon of Chinese soldiers crossed into the disputed region in the Himalayas, setting up a long series of escalating border skirmishes between the two nations. Combined with Chinese port construction in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and people always say, why? Why, did, why are the Chinese worried about those mountainous regions? And I actually read an article not too long ago about it, and it's because whoever controls, those are the headwaters for all of the rivers. So if you control the water, you can control a country. If you take a water away from a country, that's just as good as taking anything else, as food or anything else away from it. So it makes sense why Chinese think the Himalayas are so important and want to keep to bed because you know the mountains are the headwaters for the region Sri Lanka and Myanmar I'm guessing India realized they were in danger of getting boxed in by China on the maritime side as well India and the country of Sri Lanka are connected by the Polk Strait which is only about 80 kilometers wide China acquired a 99 year lease of Sri Lanka's Hambantota port after they defaulted on their loan payments to China from India's perspective, they're worried Chinese research vessels docked there could simply chill out and observe India's missile tests happening nearby. India has seen an increase in Chinese naval activity since then, including sea mapping vessels and submarines. A good way to understand all of this is by the two competing strategies that have been coined here. The first one is the one that China's using that's been called the String of Pearl Strategy, where they've spent $60 billion investing in ports around Africa and the Indian Ocean. Each pearl is a basin they connect, and one way to view this is that it's to box in and monitor India. Here's an image showing China's string of pearls, but don't look for too long, you dog. In response to this, India invested $8 billion of their own dollars into the Chabahar port in Iran and created a port at Sabang in Indonesia. This is directly on the Malacca Strait. I did not know they had a port in Sabang. I did not know they had a port in Iran. Oman, yeah, that makes sense which is a key choke point for China's oil imports. This is called India's necklace of diamond strategy. India started to seriously beef up its navy in order to stay relevant in the face of such a rival. 
Indian Chief of Naval Staff Admiral Kumar announced the country's plan to have a 175-ship Navy by 2035, along with major upgrades to existing hulls. Hit the like button and join our Task and Purpose Discord server if you haven't yet. And this is where we need to talk about the Make in India initiative. By the year 2000, India was building their own destroyers and announced an ambitious project to build their first homegrown aircraft carrier. The INS Vikrant had a long and expensive production process, taking over $2.5 billion in 13 years to complete. Yet the carrier was an important step in India's industrial capability and a major source of international prestige. Just after the Vic Grant was launched, Prime Minister Modi announced the Make in India initiative in 2014 with the goal of revitalizing India's economy as a world-class manufacturing power. Shortly after the announcement of the Make in India initiative, the country commissioned its first nuclear ballistic missile submarine in 2016, the INS Arant, with plans to build four in total. Armed with four ballistic missile tubes and an Indian-built nuclear reactor, the Ariant was another major leap forward in India's indigenous manufacturing capability. Its missiles can carry nuclear warheads 750 kilometers away, delivering on the promise of a second strike capability. The following year, India released another update. 750 kilometers? Seems kind of short. I wouldn't call that ballistic missiles. I mean, 750 kilometers, you can do that with a cruise missile. I don't know. I mean, that's just a real big parabolic. ...dated white paper that further explained their plans in the Indian Ocean. The key takeaway from the 2015 paper, it's the most recent paper, is that India widely expanded their area of primary interest to include the Strait of Hormuz, Strait of Bab el Mandab, essentially all the Indian Ocean and even some areas beyond were now marked as primary interests instead of just ones close to their shores. They also sought to take an active anti-piracy mission to demonstrate their capabilities. Admiral R.K. Dowan officially declared in the mid-2010s that India had officially transformed from a buyer to a builder navy. So let's talk about the Indian Blue Water Navy. In the face of China's head start in naval development, India had some tricks up their sleeves of their own that can even the odds. India carefully cultivated relationships with a diverse array of foreign naval engineer firms, which meant that the country could pick and choose the right technologies for their needs. This has really paid dividends for India's fleet of conventionally powered submarines. The Calivari class of diesel electric attack submarines was designed in partnership with the French Naval Group. India has six of them already with another three on the way. Diesel electric submarines can still be deadly and India has plans to add the latest in air independent propulsion technology to the class, which will dramatically improve their range and stealth characteristics. AIP Tech basically uses a fuel cell to generate electricity while the submarine is submerged, instead of relying on batteries alone. While not quite as high output as a nuclear reactor, it's actually quieter and allows a diesel electric sub to remain submerged for a much longer period of time before needing to come to snorkel. Diesel electric attack subs are faster to build and much cheaper and don't require nuclear certified dockyards to repair and maintain. India is constructing seven Nilgiri class frigates that have some of the same stealth features and BrahMos missile tubes as the larger destroyers, with another 15 anti-submarine warfare corvettes on the way to screen the Indian waters from underwater threats. This is Project 15A and 15B, the guided missile destroyers. These are a major redesign of the earlier Dali class ships as a sign of how far Indian industrial and technological expertise has come, about 60% of the 15As and their systems are fully indigenous while 90% of the 15B comes from their home turf. At 7,400 tons of displacement, these are the biggest non-carrier ships in India's fleet. Their main anti-surface striking power comes from the Indian-designed missile. These supersonic cruise missiles can hit both naval and land targets up to 500 kilometers away thanks to a liquid-fueled ramjet motor that propels the missiles at Mach 2.8. The BrahMos missile can carry 200 or 300 kilogram semi-armor-piercing high-explosive warheads or 250 kilogram of submunitions. I've heard of that missile somewhere else recently. Is the Philippines using it? 
I'll have to look and see. I've heard of it somewhere else. Well, let me, I think the Philippines is using it. Let me just see. It's depending on the version loaded into the launcher. India is also working with Russia to develop a hypersonic BrahMos 2 model based on the Russian Zykron. As of April 2023, Russia had publicly agreed to transfer key Zykron missile technologies to India as part of the deal. Both the 15A and 15B destroyers can carry up to 16 of these missiles, along with 32 Barak anti-air missiles, four torpedo launchers, two RBU-6000 anti-submarine rocket launchers, and a 76mm naval gun for good measure. This leaves them a little less lightly armed than China's latest destroyers that pack up to 112 VLS missile cells. By this point in the 2000s, India's navy had transformed into having the capability to project power further away. So now what we see is they currently have their largest deployment of two warships in the Gulf of Aden and another 10 operating in the Arabian Sea, providing security against pirates for extended periods of time. The third component of India's naval buildup is a massive centerpiece. Naval leadership confirmed in November 2023 that the country would be building a third aircraft carrier in an open challenge to the Chinese sea power. And the 2023 order allocates 5 billion bucks to the project. So what does India hope to gain from investing so much into another carrier? For one, it gains the flexibility of a third carrier battle group. With three battle groups of destroyers and frigates centered around a carrier, India can shuffle significant naval power to different crisis zones or sensitive areas of the Indian Ocean much more easily. Naval vessels aren't constantly out on patrol and periodically have to come into dry dock for extended maintenance cycles. Carriers are one of the most visible ways of projecting power abroad. The upcoming carrier will have an extended air wing of about 28 aircraft, including French-built Raphael fighters and potentially export versions of the American F-18. That's a small air wing by modern carrier standards, but India believes it will give them the support, surveillance, and striking power that they need in more remote regions of the Indian Ocean. So let's talk about the broader strategy and geopolitics of India's Navy. Given their long land border, Sorry, my cats are fighting. I wasn't sure what is was going on. We will carry on. I apologize completely for that. ...with Pakistan and China, most of India's defense spending has traditionally gone to the army. But in 2022, the proportion of funds going towards India's navy rose from 12% to 18%. Naval commentators are urging that India should really be aiming for a naval budget of 20% to really ensure that they stay competitive on the high seas. The two key words in India's naval strategy are choke points and deterrence. You see, the Indian Ocean has a unique geography among the world's oceans, hemmed in on three sides by Africa, Asia, and Australia. That means unless you want to take the long way down near Antarctica, access to the Indian Ocean and its prime shipping lanes are restricted to four main choke points. You got the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab El Mandab Strait, the Mozambique Channel, and the Malacca Strait. Over a third of total maritime trade and 80% of oil and gas shipments transit through these choke points each year. The idea behind India's naval buildup isn't really to go toe to toe with China's navy on the open ocean. It's to deter China from wanting to start a fight in the first place. Even if India's navy is smaller than China, presenting a credible threat to these choke points makes it too expensive for China to try and bully India into submission. China can't risk the economic damage a blockade in the Indian Ocean would cause. India is one of the four main members of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or Quad, along with the US, Japan, and Australia. While not exactly a NATO of the Indo-Pacific, the Quad provides the framework for a coordinated resistance to China's power plays in the region through military exercises, diplomatic channels, and economic cooperation. There isn't an outright guarantee that the members of the Quad will come to each other's defense in the case of a maritime skirmish, but rapid and coordinated sanctions against China by major trade partners could really make the consequences of any aggression sting. India has been cultivating a closer relationship with the United States and the West in recent years, preserving their strategic autonomy by recognizing that many of their geostrategic interests are better served by more reliable partners. But it's important to remember that neither India nor China want war with each other. China was India's largest trading partner from 2008 to 2021. And despite cooling relations, bilateral trade remains high between the two countries. India's naval buildup is a response to what they see as Chinese preparations to sideline India 
through building dual-use deepwater ports at key locations throughout the Indo-Pacific and using their economic influence to sway countries into China's sphere of influence. To power all this shipbuilding activity, India increased its defense funding 14%, that translates to around $72.6 billion. Because of India's partnerships with other nations, the country is in the top arms importers in the world, accounting for 9.8% of global arms sales. That's both a blessing and a curse, since it allows the country to choose from a wide range of equipment, but also represents money going out of the country that could be spent on more long-term military projects inside the country. But with India's renewed focus on self-reliance and the Make in India initiative, India is already starting to become an arms exporter. In January 2024, the Philippines announced that they buy the Brahmos supersonic cruise missile <laughs> See, I, I told you, I, I thought I had saw that something about the Philippines. I, I will find it. I read it in the headline of a video, something about Philippines having that Brahmos missile. In a contract worth $375 million. As India's defense industry grows, more orders could come in and reverse the import-export trend, fueling further increases in both defense spending and R&D projects, potentially getting India's navy up to that magic 20% threshold. India is seen as a rising star on the world stage, with the potential to influence the global balance of power as both peacemaker and a power player in their own right. Building a homegrown navy up to 175 ships within 10 years is an ambitious and expensive plan, but it could help them secure the international recognition and domestic security they need to continue that rise for decades to come. Did you know the US Air Force is upgrading the F-22 Raptor with new sensors and weapons? They're calling it the Super Raptor now. And the whole point is to deter China. If you we need the Super Raptor. I love the Raptor. That's one of my most favorite airplanes. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Let's discuss this for a minute. Okay, here we go. Um, there's a lot to discuss here. First of all, I did not realize India was working on their third carrier battle group, which is pretty impressive. Um, but you got to keep in mind, China's carriers are kind of paper tigers. And we all know what what's going on with Russia. It's just a smoking boat that can't do anything pretty much. And it has to be towed to port and towed everywhere it goes. So you got to keep that in perspective, but I think India probably has pretty decent technology and it's probably going pretty well. Um, I like their philosophy of the string of diamonds. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, the combat China string of pearls, as they called it, um, that makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense. Um, the other thing that was curious to me though, is just how they're trying to play the field. You know, they're buying all their oil from Russia. They're kind of trying to combat China, but that's their largest trading partner. You know, they've got the base in Indonesia, um, one in Iran, trying to make partnerships with the United States and Japan. Seems like they're all over the place, you know, I just think that is a bad philosophy. I can see where from a point of view it might would work, but you're going to get stuck in the middle and it's going it's, it's going to hurt you one way or the other one point. Anyways, let me know what you think in the uh, comments. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to, if you don't want to, I understand. And please stay safe and don't forget to smile. Thank you for stopping in and goodbye.